Hi, everybody. So my name is Lian Lerko. I'm a technical marketing engineer. Um, so I'm based in uh, San Jose. I work in the Cisco, uh, in the data center networking business group. So I work on the Nexus uh, ACI, Nexus dashboard product lines. And my role is mainly to uh, work on automation and any third party integration. So most of my days is with Ansible, Terraform, ServiceNow, and any of those integration. I'm probably the least experienced in NSO in this room. Uh, but I, I will argue that that's uh, the reason I'm here. Um, the whole idea of this uh, conference is to share, learn, and connect. And I think I can bring you the ex some experience that I get from the data center uh, networking side, uh, from those third-party integration that can be applied to any automation systems, including NSO. And so the, the whole idea here is to walk you through what I call the, the infrastructure as code journey, um, why, why are we embarking on that journey? What are the steps? And also looking forwards, what's kind of coming? What's the new stuff that people are thinking and are doing uh, on there? Um, I always love to start with a quote, and this quote is, I think, really, uh, really uh, well chosen for this week. Uh, Automation is to modern infrastructure, like blood is to the, the body. Without it, there's no modern infrastructure. And I think that's really, uh, if we look at all of the session of this week, it's, it's really there. So let's get started on our journey. And I call it the infrastructure as code journey because I don't think it's, there is an end to it. It's not a destination. It's really a path that's, that people can start. And you can start at different places on, on that path. And then there is, there's still going to be new points that you're going to want to reach at the, at the end. So don't see it as, oh, I'm not there yet, or I'm not. No, it's just a journey. There will always be something further to, to, at, uh, to achieve and then new, new things that gets added. So let's get started with a few definitional elements, because I, I see there's a, everybody talk about infrastructure as code, and it's all different. My view of infrastructure as code is the idea of trying to automate the provisioning of every layer of the stack, starting from the network, which is pretty much what we are going to do uh, talk uh, about here, but also the, the, the different layer on top of that. And to be able to do that, we are trying to express our infrastructure as code. By trying to write it in a way that we can then apply software development best practices that have been developed for all of the software we know and we use um, into that. So that means things like um, uh, version control, uh, uh, released, uh, yeah, uh, regression testing, and all of the elements that we can use to deliver the content on that way. It also means creating reusable portions of blocks of code that we can make it more reliable, more robust, the more we use it, we can test more. And then by doing that, we can achieve some higher, uh, we, we can achieve some benefits. And one of those benefits is really the idea that we can, the more a piece of code is robust, the more we will be okay to reuse it, the faster we are gonna implement changes because we are more confident about it. And then the faster we can implement changes, the better we align to the business goals, right? Because Right now, we generally wait because well, we don't want to get to that change window and do all of those changes at once. But if we could do a change every day, that would really speed up our changes. And it will also make us mo more confident that those ch changes will work. So if we take all of this, where do we start? Where do we start our journey? And the first part, and I think everybody probably in the room started there, is somebody just take um, an automation or a class or look at something online and start to code something, a script, or start uh, uh, defining a service in NSO on their own laptop or on a VM, but their own domain. They just start for themselves. They, they are like, oh, I want to go faster in deploying it for myself, so I'm going to start uh, for that. And then very quickly, I think, people realize that, hey, I'm using it, but hmm, I made a mistake. Um, it was working before. It doesn't work anymore. How do I get back there? And that's why re people think, OK, how, do I, how can I put save points? How can I put like instant or snapshots of my configuration? And that's where they introduce version control into the, the environment. By being able to commit the code at certain points, you are able to have known good configuration or code that you can reuse. Now, when, when you do that, you realize also that, oh, there is something else that comes with version control is you can share this code more easily because you can start to, to give it to one of your colleagues saying, hey, look, I did that, the task way faster and you can reuse this piece of code. So you start sharing your commits and so you start sharing your code with people. But very quickly, quickly you realize everybody's running their own version and then sometimes it conflicts with each other and you push the change at the same time and like, it doesn't work really well. So once there's some adoption, of this automation, 
you're going to look at moving towards having a centralized execution place for this code, for those, this infrastructure. Right? So we're progressing along this journey. We are now at a place where we have a centralized pipeline engine that will execute our code. So at this point, everybody makes a change, push it to the version control. There's some kind of approval, either pull request or the rest. And then at some point, it's centrally executed from this code. At that point, we can apply um, a lot of policies on this code because it's centralized and there is no everybody access the devices, right? So that's really one of, one of the steps. That's what people think when they think about infrastructure as code, or you might have heard the term CI, CD pipelines and the rest. That's what they have in mind, right? And that's one of the things that we need to understand a bit better. So if we look at what a CI, CD pipeline, what does it mean? It's continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, the main idea is that we will take changes to the code, small by bit by small bit, and we're going to merge it into the code base. And then when we are confident the code base is good and has been tested, we're going to deploy these changes to the infrastructure. So we're going to push that change uh, directly to the systems. And so that's really kind of the main idea here of the development, right? You make changes, you submit, you approve, you push, and then that gets pushed to the infrastructure. Now, after this, everybody asks me, okay, which tool should I use? What's, what's the element here? And I, th I say, stop. Take a step back. Let's discuss about what I think is more important. And it's what I call the engineer experience. We sometimes just jump way too fast into those, um, those tools discussion. What tools are better? And, oh, I'm using it this way and that way. But I think we sometimes don't think about how the engineers that are going to do the change every day, that are going to use this automation once it, when it's its place, how are they going to use it? What do they want it to be? And so my argument is that we should think about the engineer experience first. Like, what do they want? T pick an experience over tools, and then when you have picked the experience, let's find the tools that fits that experience. The first question you should ask you at that point is, how do I interact with the rest of, our, uh, of the organization? Because the automation is not only for me, sometimes it's also how I get my requests from people. Is that through change requests, is that ticketing? Do I offer them um, an API that they will use to request things from me? Or is, it, is there any approvals? Is it approval in the team, outside the team? All of those elements are important to define the experience you want for the, the automation after that. And then the second part is, how me as an engineer, how do I want every day to make my change that I have to do every day? Like, do I want to have a CLI? Do I want to write code? I might like to write Python or Terraform or Ansible or uh, models. Like, do, what do I want to do? Do I want to use an inventory file? Do I want to use YAML or even CSV or Excel as a data source for everything? Like, what's the way I interact with the system? Do I have a preferred UI or system like Netbox or others that I want to use to feed the data from there? And then that's my source, single source of tool, but it's also my UI. It's the way I make changes to my network. The last one is, do I want to get out of the loop? Do I want to put that to my users and give them a catalog items that they can fill in, press a button, and I just have to wait and approve. I can review and approve those elements. That's really the, the first question you should ask yourself, is what's the experience your engineers want to do every day? Because we have been spending a lot of time trying to push experience that we think is better to the people that are going to make the, the, the changes every day. And I think we should li listen to them. I think we have been trying to change the way people work. And I think we should actually fit better in the way they want to work. Um, it will, well, it will uh, help with adoption a lot, I think, uh, in that. And then when we have all of those questions answered, I think that's when we want to look at tools. That's when we want to look at those things. So if we step a little bit uh, back, remember we were at this CI CD pipeline. And then the question is, which tool? And now we have an idea of the experience we want to do. So the first things uh, in any tool you will look at is the main idea is to find a tool that allows you to normalize the construct and to be able to define the goals you want to achieve. It's normalized elements. Um, do I target, which system am I going to target? And can I find a common denominator between those systems? That can be an NSO or others. It's really the idea is defining that. Another thing is, is CI CD pipeline can be very diverse. That's the beauty of a pipeline, is that you can pick the best tools. Gardner's uh, estimates that on average, I think that's based on software development more than uh, infrastructure uh, as code, but there's at least eight tools in every pipeline of people. 
So we have to think about that. Like, what are the tools I want to put in my pipeline? What are the elements? Just as a small element, if we look at the, the, the three elements that I had put, as code, there's the classic stuff for Mansible, and I, I would argue NSO is also a way to express your infrastructure as code. On the source control, the main classic ones, right? GitLab, GitHub, uh, Bitbucket. And then on the pipeline uh, and orchestrator side, there is a, fence, uh, a, a, a gigantic amount. Even technically, I didn't put them there, but GitLab and Bitbucket has, have their own, GitHub has their own, and the more recently announced Crosswork uh, workflow manager would also be a pipeline uh, system, so a workflow systems into that. Now, as I mentioned, Garner says at least eight tools, and I think we have to start thinking about what are some of the things we want to do in our pipeline, what are common things that we want to do. And one of the things that we do in the data center and uh, that we can add in, into our pipeline is what we call pre-change validations. So before we make any change, how can I validate that the change I'm about to make is not going to impact my network? And so in the data center networking uh, segment, we have what we call Nexus Dashboard Insights. And Nexus Dashboard Insights allow us to model a change, apply it, and it's going to tell us if are we better with this change or is it implementing some, is it going to create some issues? It actually models the network and runs some checks and um, model, like mathematical model on top to make sure that the changes will not impact the system. So the, our pipelines now becomes, I make a change, I run my validation. I create more issues, I come back to the prepared change, right? It passes, I can now make the change to my infrastructure. And then I can, after that, we also have the ability to run what we call a delta analysis, which is the idea that you can, you have a point in time before your change, a point in time after your change, and I'm comparing the change. By testing that after making the change, I can now make sure that I have, if there is any issues that I didn't catch before, that I can revert. I have a, a, a step to revert my changes again. Those are some of the things you might be thinking that you need to, to, to think uh, on achieving into a pipeline. It's more than just those elements. It can add other tests and the rest. So if I dive a little bit deeper into this same pipeline, you would see that I, I make my change, I push it. And then the first things you can also do is run some validation, just linting. Am I, am I having the right schema? Am I having the right syntax, right? Very simple syntax checks. After that, I can run my change, and in this example, we are using Ansible because it has a dry run mode, but you can do that with any system. You want to run the changes in a way that you can see what changes are going to be made, and you can use that to check the validity. That's where we use the dashboard pre-change validation uh, capability. That's going to tell us, are we go or not go, right? Are we good or not? And then based on that, we can then maybe take a snapshot, maybe, and then for this, for example, we can use a different language. We can use Python or the rest, and that's one of the beauty of the pipelines, right? I keep using different tools, and I bundle them the best I want. Then I make my change to my infrastructure. In this case, I'm taking our, our controllers uh, as a target, and then I make a change. And then, for example, I can use WebEx to notify my, me or if you use another system. Um, you might see on some of my slides I put on, on, on the bottom right more details and, and a session. Most of those topics, we have a full Cisco Live session that covers them in great detail. So uh, you can see then, and there is a link for after if you want to get more information. So that's really, I just covered how we do the code portion of the experience and how we can inject into a pipeline and a system. But that's not the only experience. Some people want to do what, what I would uh, argue is called inventory-driven automation. It's they want a simple structure, a simple variable file, or a simple CSV or Excel files to modify. And so here, for example, I, I show you an example for an ACI fabric um, where you would create your tenant, and then you have VRFs, and bridge domain, I like a, a, a broadcast domain uh, boundary. This is very easy to understand. Anybody in this room, if I ask them, please add a, v add a VRF, you know what you have to do. You just add another line just below the existing one, right? And that's the whole idea of inventory-driven automation, is the idea that we separate the data from the logic, and we give you a, an easy model to understand to modify elements. And you can, mod you can create your own model, right? There is no element. The idea is that it feels similar, it feels easy, and the learning curve is, is very low to, uh, to get there. So from an operation perspective, you don't have to train as much people, and you can really get people to be comfortable with that. What happened in the background is that this Lot this code or this this YAML definition in this case get translated by some code 
and then get pushed to your infrastructure. In this case, we talk about ACI, so I'm pushing it there. On the data center uh, networking side, we have released a project that's called Nexus S Code, which up is specifically uh, an inventory uh, driven ap approach. It doesn't use an SO8 use Terraform in the background, but my argument is it gives you an idea of view of what a model could look like uh, if you wanted to do uh, inventory driven. I want also to, to shout out there is um, uh, a session that's, that's tomorrow at 11.20 uh, by one of our colleagues that's talking about inventory-driven automation for an SO. Uh, a proof of concept is, is showing up in that session. So if you want more, and th this there is an example here of what it could look like for uh, some SR segments or, or VC uh, class. And so if you want more detail on that, I would pu put you towards this se that session to have more detail on, on what's possible here. So that's the inventory-driven portion, right? So I'm taking a CSV and a YAML file and I, I'm pushing it through. But now, if we look... Yeah, you have a question. Don't hesitate if you have a question. No. Mm -hmm. So, the thing is that, as I mentioned at the start, you have to pick the experience you want. And then when you have that experience, you will generally try to make all of your change through that, right? So in this case, yes. If you wanted, to, for example, to, to change an element, you would change this file. So I don't know if you, for example, want to add another uh, access device or access interface or elements, you will add, you will modify that file. The idea is that the way you interact with your automation is through this definition, through this file. If there's other question, I'll hesitate to interrupt and ask. Uh. So that's how we deal with uh, on the inventory-driven side. Now, I also mentioned that we can do, we can use a third-party UI, a database, or a, a system, and that's what we call one way of achieving that is what we call event-driven automation. The idea is that you stop driving it by user inputs, but you drive it by system-to-system -system communication. So that could be. Um, a UI, a systems, another system that a user still manipulates, but then from this system, that source of truth to the other systems, you don't have a human interaction anymore. It's all automated. So how does that look like? This is a generic version of what event-driven would look like. You would have any, a change, and that change should be detected in some way by a database or something. This, there's a notification of that change to a trigger mechanism. This trigger mechanism will then make the change to the infrastructure based on that event. So this is very generic, but there's a few implementation we should look at. The first one that was put uh, out there was called Network Infrastructure Automation from Ashicorp. So Ashicorp, which is uh, the, the company behind Terraform, came out with this idea of using their product called Console, which is a service uh, discovery mechanism, service monitoring um, and uh, service catalog system, to monitor an application that's deployed and based on that information, notify a binary that they release that's called Console Terraform Sync. And when it receives an event, it automatically apply a Terraform plan, and based on that, execute what the infrastructure change. For this, for example, uh, in the data center side, uh, for ACI, we released two use cases. The first use case was dynamic membership of a security group. So how do we create, if you want, ACL groups uh, in ACI, how do you make sure the membership grows and shrink based on actual device being generated. Because today, you can so quickly generate containers, VMs, or other elements that manually making that change into those group membership doesn't make any sense. We want to automate that system to system. When a device comes up, it gets added to the right group. That was the first uh, use case. The second use case is you can also use your SCI fabric as a gigantic stupid load balancer. Um, it can do load balancing at line rate on any interface, uh, so we can do multi gig, multi hundred gig uh, load balancing, but it just do, de do that pretty stupidly. It doesn't have high level of uh, way to detect if a uh, host is up or down. But with using this, we can use console's layer seven monitoring to change the configuration of our load balancer. And so, if uh, host doesn't reply the right HTTP code, we can modify that. Right now, if we push this even further we could use another system. So what I did in this, uh, in this proof of concept, I took the console Terraform Sync and I modified it so that it doesn't take console as an input anymore, but it takes Netbox. And so in this example, and you can see a demo in, in the DevNet session if you want, the I make a change to Netbox, let's say I create a VLAN, and automatically it applies this to my network. 
And the beauty of those is because it uses a generic uh, system like Terraform, it can do that to any type of infrastructure. It doesn't really matter what it is. If I can take this change and apply it, and I can write a Terraform plan to apply it, it works. So that's really one of the strengths of this, of this event-driven automation. Now, this is custom code. That's something we, we are going to release uh, as an open source project, but that's not something necessarily um, that everybody can use. But Ansible has released something very interestingly in the na last few months. It, they call it event-driven Ansible, and it's the same concept. The idea is to use source of data, uh, process it through something they call a rule book, and a rule book defines a source of the data, condition that applies on that data, and then how do I make my changes. And it uses Ansible modules to do all of that. So it's very well known and very well co uh, uh, corrected. So in this case, for example, Nexus Dashboard Inside that I talked earlier, on top of the pre-change validation that it can do, it can also detect if there is ano anomalies in your network or if there is advisory. So anomalies are things that are not right. Advisories are Cisco can tell you what you are doing something wrong or there's something that needs to change. And based on that, you can publish that on a on generic Kafka topic. So Kafka is a subscriber publisher systems that allow you to, uh, to send event notification. And so Ansible Rulebook is a generic Kafka uh, broker. So you can automatically get notification from Kafka and react to it and make changes. Now you're going to tell me, hey, you have been talking about Ansible Terraform, but I'm here to talk about NSO. So how can I link those things together? And that's one of the things that may, uh, you can look at. There is actually a collection for uh, NSO for Ansible, which you could use in this concept today. There is also an open source project on uh, uh, on Terraform that has uh, an NSO uh, element. This, so those are things that you can have a look at to use some of those concepts directly with those systems. So you can pilot your NSO from another system is if you need to. Now, that that's not all. Come back to my generic version here. You can write this trigger mechanism to in your own language. It's just that that's an additional effort you will have to do, that if you use something like Terraform or Ansible, you can e reuse something that somebody else has done. But nothing prevents you today to write a Python code that takes the information and push it. I don't know if you were here yesterday uh, on the other track. Uh, our colleagues Anna showed something very similar using Python to put pull information from Netbox and push it into, um, uh, into NSO. So those are also possibilities. I'm just trying to make you to give you the idea of what event-driven is and what are the possibilities. Now, the last uh, user experience we talked about was service catalog, the ability to push to someone else this the, the form or the data collection element. And then you, you can just stay behind, approve or disapprove some of those. And in there, I, I want to talk a, a little bit of what of the, some of the capability that ServiceNow offers and that you can join with our uh, automation capability. The first one is you can push directly to NSO, actually, because NSO is an API, and so you and uh, ServiceNow is a generic REST connector. So you can just, if you write the payload correctly, just trigger the automation you want. That's one way of, of connecting. The other way is using the generic connection for Ansible or Terraform that exists in ServiceNow, and again, using the, the elements I mentioned just before to connect them together. The second part that you need to look at is there is integration with this, the ServiceNow CMDB from our own product. So on the data center networking side, most of our product have an integration with ServiceNow where you can, we can pull data into ServiceNow. By putting that data into ServiceNow, we can use it when you do forms in the, in the service catalog to pre-fill dropdowns. So for example, if I want you to select a VRF in which you want to add that interface we were discussing about earlier, I can just put a list, a dropdown, and I, it refers to exactly what's already created. So if I create a new one from another workflow, then I, it's, it becomes available automatically. Those are the beauty of having both a CMDB integration and a push mechanism to your system. So that's, I think, one of the things that we really want to um, have a look at. So just uh, to summarize a little bit, the infrastructure as code for me, it's not a destination. Don't think you are going to get there. It's a journey. Start where you can. Figure out where you are and figure out what are the next steps you want to have a look at. Look first at the engineering experience. Think about, go back and think, have we picked up the experience we want? Or is it the experience we were told it's better for us? So that's one of the elements. Then think about event-driven to remove yourself or uh, and 
free some time because systems can talk to each other. You don't necessarily have to make those changes uh, ma manually through automation. And then the last thing is we have a ton of content our, on our DevNet learning labs that can get you started in some of those topics. So don't hesitate to jump there to see what's available, what are the elements. Um, I've put notes in all of the slides when it refers to, to a Cisco Live session. Some of those have also labs attached in, in, um, in DevNet, so you can have a look there. So that's my last slides. I have a few more minutes if you have any questions. Do you do we have people on Slido or remotely that ask questions? Yeah. So you mean if somebody access the devices and make changes separately from the this pipeline, right? So that's one of, that's one of the, the elements you're going to have an issue across all the automation. At some point, and I think yesterday in uh, the one of the main presentations, I think they, they were right. At some point, you have to make a choice. You have to have one way of configuring things. Reconciliation is always going to create a problem. You're going to always have an issue of what has been created, and you're going to get systems that fight. So you have to define what's your source of truth. And that your source of truth needs to be on the left side of this system. Um, for so I think that's one of the things that you're going you're gonna to have, have to decide. You're going to have to block access, I think, at some point. Um, at least that's my view. Uh, reconciliation will always be a problem for any automation system uh, in the future. So NSO would be, in that case, NSO abstract your infrastructure, right? That, that's the whole idea of how NSO, uh, of, of the idea of services in NSO, right? Um, by doing that, you can abstract those elements and you can simplify how you push the changes and how those, those changes create more uh, changes. But it doesn't necessarily solve your issue of reconciliation because the problem is where is the change coming from, right? In this case, it's an event. More likely, in this case, it's going to be a one-shot type of fix, so you don't necessarily need reconciliation, but if you do something like this, reconciliation needs to be kind of enforced. This is where some tools like Terraform kind of forces the configuration, um, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily better uh, on that side. So you either have to build in that middle layer, uh, you have, you have on in this, this sink, you have to build that reconciliation there if you push directly to the system, or you have to prevent the co the, this element to, to happen and by blocking access, for example. Is this the same? Is we uh, do in CLI the sync tool? It's like a replacement or other way to make the sync tool? So it's I think it's another way to make the sync tool because the sync tool is just pushing from your model. Mm -hmm. Here it's actually before that. How do you define what needs to be pushed, right? So the sync tool is I define I have something that's defined and I want to make sure the device has this configuration that's defined. Here is how do you define that state you want to push. But uh, you are going to push also to the devices with yes. this? Yes. Okay, so Correct. it's like... So it's, it's both, it's, so you are going to say, this is the content I want, and then your controller or your NSO in, in that case will make sure that this, this gets pushed downstream, okay. right? Okay. So, so it's, it's a higher level construct at, okay. at that point. Okay. Yep. Just to understand that, uh, I, I saw that you, you are not using the the GitLab to trigger the uh, some operations. I, uh, you you don't have it on your slides. I don't know if it's something that you so don't want to use it or yeah. So if we look at this example a bit earlier, this would be triggered by get a, a get a pull request, for example. Again, it's coming back to the experience you want. If your experience is I want to write code, push the commit the code and push the code, and then that triggers the element. You would more likely use a pipeline of this style, or you will use the event driven, uh, the sorry, the inventory driven uh, element. So it's not one or the other. I, I think one of the things is I'm not telling you the event driven is better. It, 
at some point, I think people will combine things together. You will have event-driven to things where you have system-to-system -system communication, and then you will have either uh, inventory-driven or code-driven or service portal-driven for like the first change, like adding elements to the system that are not system-to-system, -system, but human-to-system. So you can combine GitLab triggers to the, all of those elements. It just depends on what, what is the elements that, that create this change. Good. I think we are just on time, so thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, I hope that was interesting for you, and if you have any questions, just uh, comment.